Picture a darkly lit room, and in the corner there are bags filled with money, and someone is counting it. It's Bill Clinton. But first, do consider donating www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. An interesting thing is going on in politics. So there's a lot of big money out there, a lot of big money promises, but at the same time, small donors under $200 becoming a significant factor on the race. In 2016, for the first time, It's on both the Democratic and Republican side. Bernie Sanders kind of representing this novel force in politics. He doesn't have a super PAC. He's raised more than $20 million from donations of $200 or less. But it is not novel in a sense, especially when you consider how easy the mechanism is for donating on an individual level. Their websites are available. Donations can be made that way. 2004, Howard Dean, Vermont governor, candidate for president on the Democratic side, raised 60% from people who were contributing $200 or less. Ron Paul, in his 2012 presidential campaign, raised $36 million from these small donors. But, you know, this is one of those areas where, with a historical viewpoint, you realize that it's not new. Small money was always part of American politics, particularly on the more radical fringes, where there wouldn't be support from business people. Socialists running at the turn of the century, the dramatic campaign of Eugene Debs, those campaigns were run on small money, and it added up a lot. Party dues from local, county, state chapters, entry fees that would be paid to get into certain meetings where Debs might be speaking, Newspaper subscriptions, all of these helped to finance Deb's effort. In 1912, the Socialist Party of America had 110,000 dues-paying members, sending thousands of dollars each month to the national group, which fed into Deb's campaign. This afforded Eugene Debs to have literature, to pay for offices and typewriters, to put out various publications, to pay for a train car that would go across the country and his very own marching band. Eugene Debs is on top of it too. He's writing letters to the National Committee, tracking campaign expenses, trying to make sure that they don't go into debt, asking about various things. Nor was Eugene Debs' Socialist Party of America a modern or anything unique. Unions and other groups have been raising small money all the time. One of the most effective weapons a labor group could offer, their national labor group, was to raise money from workers, hat pass, meeting, contributions, dues, raise money from workers all over the nation for the help of a relief fund for striking workers in one part of the nation. It was one of the most powerful weapons that a labor union could use because without that, many workers would be reluctant to go on strike. So on that side of politics, small money is nothing new. But for modern politics, I think the history of of the use of small money is experimental and accidental. And the old way that you raised money was you went to your wealthy neighbors, your friends from your hometown, and those in your home state. If you were a congressman or a senator, maybe the large businessmen in your state who they wanted to support you, and yes, they wanted someone in Washington representing their interests as well, or at least to have an open door. You went to them and said, look, you supported my campaign for congressman or for senator. Now I'd like to start a committee to run for president. Can you contribute? And in 1972, when 
George McGovern is running and he's starting to get, because of his opposition to the Vietnam War, he's starting to get a lot of support among the type of people who had supported Eugene McCarthy or Robert Kennedy in 1968. McGovern even runs at the convention in 1968. He certainly doesn't win, but he's a leading candidate now for 1972. And so he approaches friends and neighbors, large businessmen in South Dakota, just like any other candidate would. It, his initial approach, even though he's coming from a very radical type of politics, his initial approach is no different than even a GOP senator would running for president. It's like, well, guys, uh, let's send that letter out. Except that he's got a guy on his campaign, Morris Dees. Dees was and is the head of the Southern Poverty Law Center. And he's saying to him, we raise all our money from people who are our members. This letter that you have going out to maybe 100 people, let's try sending it to thousands. You've got popular support for your position in Vietnam. And Dees goes on. And so I took the original letter we had written, and they made some good corrections. And we got the list that McGovern had wanted to mail, which was basically his friends and neighbors. And I added to it some selected names from people who like to give to things, like the ACLU donor list at the time, which wasn't really big. The progressive and liberal magazines, like Psychology Today, and things like that. And we got another 200 or 300,000 names and tested those lists. And I used U.S. Senate letterhead and U.S. Senate envelopes, which is, I think, illegal today. And while it didn't work to outmatch Richard Nixon's fundraising in 1972, it did raise millions of dollars. It raises $4 million for McGovern before he even gets to the convention, allows him to secure the nomination. Once he does, then the McGovern for President campaign had a variety of sources of money as the official Democratic nominee, t-shirt sales, some big donors, Democratic Party state committees, fundraising dinners, law firm bundling, uh... A concert that's held in Los Angeles, which Barbara Streisand, James Taylor, Carole King played at. Each of the people that went to see the concert paid up to $100 a ticket to hear their favorite artists. In the audience, Jack Nicholson, Julie Christie, Gene Hackman, Burt Lancaster, John Voight, Robert Vaughn, Mama Cass, John Philip Law, Gregory Peck, Carly Simon, Joni Mitchell. She had this odd thing that goes on. Now, Nixon's going to raise $60 million to McGovern's $30 million, through all, even though he's got all those efforts. He's going to get beat out in terms of the fundraising game. But something happens that's interesting, and this from David Moranis' first in his class, the biography of Bill Clinton, talking about Clinton as a member of the Texas for McGovern team. Astoundingly, in the final days of the McGovern campaign, they were awash in money. The direct mail fundraising was generating an astounding 25% return in a field where 3% was normal. In other words, the more that voters felt that McGovern was going to lose the election, the more animated and excited they became. Here's what Tony Podesta said. We had this huge cadre of donors who were desperately committed in George McGovern who thought he was the messiah who could end the war in Vietnam. It was like a Ponzi scheme in the end, Podesta said. We couldn't raise the money fast enough. We couldn't count the money fast enough. We couldn't spend the money fast enough. One night, a McGovern advisor noticed 30 canvas bags in the room among various debris. What's in those bags, he said. He opened one up and found it stuffed with envelopes containing cash and checks, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Advisors were calling radio stations and wiring payments sooner than they could even write scripts for radio ads. And in the Texas campaign office, a young law student named Bill Clinton was sorting out stacks of envelopes and dollars. This much for San Antonio. This much for Houston. I've got to get this all out by tomorrow morning. But it wasn't only money the young Bill Clinton was interested in something else. Bill Clinton had been observed writing down the names and addresses of some of these donors for his index cards that would serve as a basis of his later campaign. Now, you might think that there's a big lesson here, 
that you've got to try to create a lot of drama. You have to try to go after these small donors. But here's where I think it's interesting. Young Bill didn't really seem to learn too much from those bags of money. I mean, a little, at least the knowledge that when you ask people, they will give. And Clinton was a prodigious fundraiser. He had no problem asking anyone for political funds. A campaign manager's dream he was. He was one of the first politicians, Clinton, to utilize a computer. Here's what Moranis writes. The computer became the mechanical extension of Clinton's tireless personality. What else? What else? It ran around the clock, churning out glad-to-meet-you letters, fundraising solicitations, special letters for first-time supporters. No other politician in Arkansas had anything comparable. But yet, Clinton's focus in using the computer or his own solicitations was to get large donors. He never intended to limit people to $200 or to keep them there for long. Clinton was about big money, and when he would run for the presidency in 1992, he'd outraise the Republicans, 92.9 million to 92.6 million. Then in the next election, he became the first presidential candidate to exceed 100 million. Only about 20% of his money in those races came from people who donated less than $200. And numerous news articles and statements from the campaign highlighted how the Democratic campaign in 1992 was appealing to corporate executive CEOs of company that the Democratic Party had become acceptable for business. So you had a candidate that really benefited from a small donor explosion, but he didn't win the election. So you have the situation where we're in today. And according to OpenSecrets.org, their take on it is small money is good for press, but for re-election, candidates go to the big money. 63% of funds, for instance, raised by congressional candidates in 2010 came from PACs or large donors. Only 13% from those donating under $200. And the numbers are similar now. The development of small donors and the ability of all of us to participate in what had been an esoteric practice of giving money still hasn't changed that much. It's still true that 0.31%, 0.31, less than a third of 1% of the American people give more than $200. 0.05%. Give more than $2,500. Billionaire Thomas Thayer gave $74 million to Democratic candidates in 2014. Sheldon Ailson gave $6 million. Charles Koch, $5 million. Bloomberg, $28 million to various candidates. The stakes, of course, are higher as Koch has planned to, depending on which account you agree with, either $900 million, almost a billion dollars, or $300 million. Steyer is, is planning to spend what it takes, a hint that he might equalize that amount. Yet if just 2% of the American adult population, that's 4.6 million people, gave just $200 who didn't give this amount before, that would be 930 million and enough to turn all of this discussion in a very different direction. That's where I think the opportunity in small money is that's being missed is so few people donate. So few people are actually involved in American politics, just like there's large amounts of non-voters. There's a large amount of non-donors that could be tapped into. Now, it might be argued that times are rough. They don't have the money to spend it. Well, if we compare... There are about 32 million Americans who spend over $400 a year in fantasy football. Well, fantasy sports, but the bulk of it being football. Leading to a $15 billion market there. The amount that is untapped in that group is enormous. It speaks to perhaps a bit of economic conditions. It also speaks to culture that that. For a while, you know, politics in America is is not seen as something that's a positive to to get involved in. It's seen as a negative that perhaps Americans don't think that if they gave anything, it would help. And I do think that the more there is that involvement, in other words, the more that people are involved, not only in voting, not only in supporting, making phone calls for 
sending emails for, using social media to support a candidate. But the more people were involved financially contributing to the politics that they agree with, the better the democracy would be. I think there's a case to be made there. It's, on, it's, on, it's obvious on its face. The more people participating, the better, because the ability of one of these guys to kind of drown out other voices is severely limited. And candidates could get more courage knowing that they could take a stand and there still will be funds available. They don't have to go to just a few sources for their money. On the other hand, I think you also have to be realistic about the potential of small money from a very long-term historical perspective. Other improvements that have been made in other facets of American politics, and I think about two. One is the expansion of the voter franchise, you know, from going from people who owned property to all white males, to all males, to all males and females, 18 to 21 year olds. The expansion of the voter franchise is one dramatic change in the electoral process. And the primary system, the introduction of the primary system, so that it's not a group of bosses in a room per se, picking a candidate. It's the people picking a candidate. The same kind of enthusiasm for small money now is the kind of enthusiasm that you saw Woodrow Wilson, others who were advocating the primary system at the turn of the century. And while I think there are a good number of improvements from all of those things, certainly better that more people are participating in the democracy, that more people can vote, it's certainly better of who a party's we kid ourselves if we don't think that there still are some, say, corrupting influences in those practices. So as democracy expanded and there's more voters, then the attention went to who can raise more money to reach all of those voters. And the same in the primary system. It well may be that no longer can some obscure boss pick a candidate because they'll have to run in a primary and win. But there still are meetings like that that occur as to who will get the support of various people and money to run in those primaries or significant endorsement of labor unions or various other activist groups in the Republican and Democratic Party to win their primaries. In most places, it can't be cigar filled rooms anymore. But nonetheless, there still are meetings. So I think the improvements that the expansion of voting and the primary system brought have to be tempered with the reality that politics are politics, and the same here. So if you go to a system where it's a lot more small money, I think there still are corrupting influences because, first of all, you'll have to advertise to get the small money. There'll be, there'll be ads aimed at just getting small money donors and who provides that source. The organizers of politics are very crafty in finding ways to control uh, situations like that. So you'll have... Uh, a better organization of small money donors. And you can expect that the parties be the first to be involved in any uptick in the small money group. We shouldn't just think it's going to be a few crusading heroes who will who will benefit from it. So I think improvement for the doc democracy, not necessarily novel, and right now not going on in one nth of the potential out there. There's a story about Lyndon Johnson, and we love stories about Lyndon Johnson here, that he saw a memo written by an aide that uh, mentioned him in the third person as Lyndon B. Johnson. And he said to the aide, use LBJ. Then he paused, disappointed that the aide didn't understand. And he said, FDR, LBJ, get it? Franklin Roosevelt was Lyndon Johnson's idol, his model for a president, his measure of what a successful president looked like. And Johnson got something about the use of initials, perhaps. I received this question on Quora, and I'm on Quora, Q-U-O-R-A, answering questions quite a bit. JFK, FDR, LBJ, why do we use these initials for some presidents and not for others? Well, first, I think it's a shortcut, but it also... As Lyndon Johnson, I think, figured out, it also means something. First, the obvious. In the days before computer layout, try putting Franklin Delano Roosevelt in a tiny campaign pin, such as the ones made with the initials FDR in red, white, and blue. 
sent out during the candidate's time in 1936. So you start with, the initials are there to save space, to save writer's cramp, and yes, in a newspaper era, to save precious column inches. Especially for a name you're going to be writing a lot of. Reporters used TR for Teddy Roosevelt. In Britain, they used LG for Lloyd George. In the period before his presidency, Franklin Roosevelt was referred to as F.D. Roosevelt in the New York Times. That's the way they made sure to separate him from his cousin, the other Roosevelt, and to hint at the Delano name, which was also important in state. After the first term, FDR earns his three letters, and you see that in the newspaper. Often, I would say, at least in the New York Times, mid-1930s onward. Now, Roosevelt must have accepted this because his car in Georgia had FDR on the license plate. When John F. Kennedy comes into office, the precedent thus exists. And JFK was used during the 1960 campaign in pins and in slogans like All the Way with JFK. But Kennedy was used more often in the campaign. One 1960 pin says, All the Way with JFK, hyphen, Kennedy. So you had to have both you get the sense that the young senator hadn't earned his initials yet. JFK is used a lot now and after the president's death, but there were plenty of news references to those initials during his presidency. Joseph Berger, a New York Times reporter, writes in an article on April 16, 1961, that the candidate liked JFK. The request was made in reference to the alternative of calling him Jack, which he didn't want once he was elected. Here's what Berger said. President Kennedy's wish not to be called publicly by his nickname is being respected by the men and women who report the news and write the headlines. For one thing, they like him personally. Always have. Every Ike, Dick, and Henry knows that. And for another, the JFK, which he himself suggested, takes up less space. So it appears that Kennedy himself was suggesting the use of the initials. The real question is, why did journalists listen? Berger suggests that it's because reporters liked the candidate. But I'd say the FDR-TR precedent was there. The idea of shortening the name, avoiding the dreaded Jack that would make him look like father's son. But why JFK, FDR, LBJ, and not others? Well, these are precedents about which so much has been written and will be written. And thus, while there is a lot talked about, Jimmy Carter here and there, we don't need J-E-C for Jimmy Carter. Just not at the point of needing to abbreviate. I've also seen D-D-E for Eisenhower in book indexes only. And, you know, as far as Hubert Humphrey, H-H-H didn't really catch on. Okay, speaking of J-E-C, how did Jimmy Carter go from being a Georgian peanut farmer to President of the United States? This I'm asked on Quora. And my answer is... When a lot of people run in a primary, there can be a surprise when one person gets the attention in a field too crowded for the voters to pay attention. But that doesn't have anything to do with the politics of today, right? First, though, I have to say, Jimmy Carter, peanut farmer, it's kind of a mislabel. If you had asked me this question, how did Jimmy Carter go from being a naval officer on an atomic submarine to becoming president of the United States? It might not be much of a question at all. But that's just as much the reality. Nuclear engineer, worked with Admiral Rickover on creating the United States atomic fleet. He inherited his father's large peanut farm. And he had to take over after his father's death. And he did get the family out of debt. He did do the planning and the cultivating under duress. His naval experience in any other election would have been front forward. And you never would have heard very much about the rest of it. But 1976, time of distrust in the government, imperial presidents, and so he emphasized that peanut farmer bit. Jimmy Carter had been in state politics for 13 years before he became president. He served as a Georgia state senator and then served one term as the governor of Georgia. He did attract some attention as one of the New South governors, beat candidates that were considered out and out racists. He appeared on the cover of Time during this period. So he was an outsider, but the idea that he was completely unknown, you know, could be challenged a bit. He also ran the DCCC, Democratic Party's 
successful campaign committee for Congress. This is not well known. And in a very unusual step, Carter ran both the gubernatorial and congressional fundraising efforts for the Democratic Party in 1974. That's a thankless job, but one that's a little bit at odds with the outsider image. It's quite an insider task, actually, to be the key fundraiser for the party. Democrats won big in 1974 in both efforts, and that helped him build up his contacts. Carter was also a delegate at the 1972 convention who attempted to stop McGovern from becoming the nominee. And in that effort, he worked with Richard Daley, the mayor of Chicago, and that relationship would pay dividends later. In fact, he is the one who nominates Henry Scoop Jackson for president in 1972 as part of a Stop McGovern effort. And then Carter puts his own name in to become the vice presidential nominee in 72. He doesn't win. He does get 30 votes. That means he comes in eighth in a very large group of people. He actually comes ahead of Ted Kennedy and Eugene McCarthy for the 1972 vice presidential nomination. None of this should distract, though, from the political accomplishment that was the primary of 1976 that I think, if nothing else, Jimmy Carter's place in history will always be, uh, in addition to, I think, his his being an example of an ex-president and some of the things he did as president, but one of the key moments will always be the 1976 primary and the way he just sort of uprooted politics. And it's an example for candidates running in primaries since then. When he decided to run, even though he was coming from a moderate to conservative side of the party, he followed the same type of grassroots tactics that McGovern did. Carter went to Iowa early. He worked the delegates. He was out there saying, you know, my name is Jimmy Carter and I'm running for president. I will never tell a lie. You couldn't get away with that, but he could. He had no history of being in Washington, either in the House, Senate, or executive branch. And the other candidates did in 76. And that was a key factor. Because as much as people didn't trust Nixon at that point, they were probably going to vote for a Democrat, everyone from Washington looked a little bad. He was from a small rural state, and that played in Iowa. He brought with him his peanut brigade, friends and family from Plains, Georgia, who would help convince Iowa voters that Jimmy was a regular guy, not like the imperial presidents. He would say some things that probably some other candidates could never pull off, like He also had a way of blending the issues. It was even called at the time a little fuzzy. Carter would pick up some religious voters, though sometimes when those voters would go out to see him and expecting him to start to quote Bible verses and to say that he was going to use religion in the White House, he'd say the opposite, that he wanted to keep the wall of separation intact. They'd be disappointed. He had some McGovern-like positions on Vietnam. The Vietnam War was over, but he said that we should avoid all wars, that you and I don't murder people and neither should our government. You know, these kind of statements he made. He advocated for pardons for Vietnam draft dodgers. This combination worked and he had a surprise win in Iowa over the other candidates. I mean, he's technically defeated by an uncommitted slate, but it didn't matter. The media story was that Jimmy Who had won Iowa. Once he did that, he goes to New Hampshire, wins that and goes on to further wins. Now, his being from the South, but not being one of the racists that people were used to seeing, like George Wallace, he could play in states like Florida, Texas, North Carolina, and Georgia. He was kind of mixed on busing, criticized the court decision, saying that uh, the court is still talking about the South and the North is still going free. So we can kind of sympathize with Southerners without really advocating for policies that might annoy Northerners. Opponents like Scoop Jackson, Frank Church, couldn't even play in the South, so he got both delegates and a reputation as a Wallace alternative once he won Florida. He's from a neighboring state, and that helped. Now, his relationship with boss Richard Daly in Chicago would help him win Illinois. But most importantly, in a crowded field of nearly 13 candidates, official and unofficial, Carter was in early and absorbed the media attention and the oxygen while others fought it out for what little they could get. But I really think the moment that Carter won his nomination was April in Pennsylvania. It was an interesting primary. No one was thinking that Pennsylvania in 76 would be high noon. But by the time you got to April, you had a split. Carter wins Iowa, New Hampshire. He's kind of the phenome. Florida, Vermont. Scoop Jackson had won 
Massachusetts and was aiming for a win in Pennsylvania to kind of show that Carter was just a fluke. Just like you had in other states, Carter had friends and family campaigning for him. He targets small cities and towns. Scoop Jackson had Philadelphia. But Carter would target Reading, Wilkes-Barre, Erie, Scranton. And you had this thing that I think was unique to that campaign, that it was almost a crusade between people sick of Watergate and sick of Wallace and racism. Carter's getting some converts. You know, he contacts everyone that he graduated with in Annapolis in 1947. One of them, out of the blue, a Republican, switches to, to become a Democrat and runs his Pennsylvania campaign for him. This happened all the time with Carter. A woman sees him in the Atlanta airport and joins the campaign as a volunteer. The assistant attorney general of Alabama quits his job to goes on to, to work as an advance man for him. A state senator from Pennsylvania who just got elected from the Amish country is recruited to speak on his behalf to local crowds and does so. Carter's scheduler is a guy he just met from Virginia who had a food service business and puts it on hold after he sees Carter speaking while he's on vacation and wants to join. There was just something about it. It was so different from the politics of that time. Probably his biggest recruit was Pete Flaherty, the popular mayor of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, an independent-minded Democrat who himself, without being solicited, calls up Carter's campaign and offers it to help. Indeed, he won Pennsylvania with 37% of Scoop Jackson's 25 and Mo Udall's 19. Jackson quits the race, and I believe at that moment the nomination was Carter's. Because at the same time, Hubert Humphrey is kind of watching what's going on, thinking, I could probably get in this, or maybe get in during the convention. After Pennsylvania, he does not. Carter, after Pennsylvania, wins Texas, the friendly Georgia primary, Indiana, Connecticut, gets the nomination, and in a very close election, the Ford pardon of Nixon, I believe, and Carter's appeal to Southern voters in the general election, which Ford at that point could not match, wins the election for him, and he's president. Carter 76 primary, I think, will always be an inspiration to people who are just getting into politics or are backing a candidate who's a long shot or that person that just has Carter did. And, and this is something we really haven't seen as much since then. He was just a person who was committed and who believed he was going to be the president of the United States. And Carter's 76 primary campaign, I think, will continue to, to always be an inspiration that an American politics is an any given Sunday type event where anything can happen. And it's not just that the establishment always wins. I want to thank you for listening. It's a short one, but a uh, couple topics there. www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com is where you can go for more episodes. Also, if you'd like to make a donation to help, you can make a donation there. Thanks for listening.